Bless your father. Lord, we just thank you, Father, Lord, that uh, your word is pure, Father. And Lord, that it's eternal. Lord, we just thank you, Father, for uh, touching each of us tonight. Lord, I pray, Father, Lord, just bless your word to us. Open our hearts, our minds, and our spirits, Lord. Guide and teach us through your spirit, Father, through your Holy Spirit. As you've said in your word, Father, that your word will not go forth and return to you empty. Lord, let it just fill us up in Jesus' name tonight. Amen. Amen. So, last week's one. <sighs> I'm just going to recap on a couple of things and then throw another scripture in. <laughs> So we started off with Nicodemus, who was the uh, the uh, Pharisee of Pharisees, similar to Paul. He was quite high up in that area. He taught um, the, the religious people and the religious structure of that day. And uh, he came to Jesus by night, so he didn't want to be seen. And um, he asked him the question, you know, what must I do? Mm. And he said, you must be born again. Yes. And so we talked about this whole issue of being born again. So, uh, and I talked a little bit about before the flood, in Genesis, God created man. Elohim, which means God's in his own image. So the first Adam was created as a God as such. He had eternal life if he took up the, tr the, the um, fruit of the tree. And the second Adam, which is Jesus Christ, um, is a God as such too. Uh, in that he came down uh, as, a, as a, um, a son from the living God. His father was God. Now, interesting thing we're talking, I was talking to Carol this morning. Just to throw this in. He... Um, he got Mary pregnant before she was married. Mm. I've never thought about that before. We've got Christmas mm -hmm. coming up. Mm. And like, what an unusual thing. <laughs> 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 the Holy Spirit covered her and she was pregnant. Yeah. It was all prophesied and all of that. Boom, 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 boom. And, and like, Joseph was surprised. What do I do now? Mm. You know? because of all the law scenarios, so he married her. And he, he did that when the angel spoke to him. Yeah. So that's interesting. You see, our Lord, I always say, you know, he's radical. God is radical. Yes. In the lineage of Jesus Christ, you have the prostitute, Rahab. Mm -hmm. She was there. You have uh, the... Um, um, who was... Uh, Ru in Ruth. Ruth, Book of Ruth, you have... Uh, the, Naomi. what's the other, Naomi. Naomi. Naomi in there as well. Mm. Uh, you have Bathsheba. Mm. They come out of a rooftop, you know, and ended up this whole scenario of David and in the lineage. And then, you know, you have Mary conceiving before she was married yep. to the point where Joseph had to make a decision, you know, what, he, what he's going to do. So what does that say about a God? You know, I don't know all the answers, uh, but I do know that our Lord sort of snubs his nose at a lot of stuff that we think is, you know, should pretty standard. And um, he makes a mockery out of the, uh, the wisdom of our world and he makes a mockery out of the laws of our world as such because he says, you know, if you want to be wise in the kingdom of God, you'd be a fool here upon the earth. I was chatting to um, Kathy, you know, just about some of the people I work for and you know the particular they have about the home and the money they spend on things, bits and pieces and, and stuff you see around the place and yet you know they in the world today they do all of this and they, they pursue the world and its stuff and they lose a relationship between each other for that mm -hmm. and their children. You know? And I mentioned about my, my kids and all of that, you know, what happened? That's true too. Um, I tried hard in the Christian sense to, to do the right thing there and, and I ended up with a whole unbelieving family. 
So the Lord, He does, He does, uh, He just, you know, uh, He's a radical. He's He's chosen the foolishness, foolishness, the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. So I think you know that scenario there. I've never thought about it before. Christmas coming up. Here we have, in a sense, a, an illegitimate child, which was Jesus. Yeah. You know, because he was conceived before the marriage. You have to. You have to be pure. I know, but before the marriage. Yeah, you couldn't be married because you had to be had to be pure. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's so interesting, isn't it? Yeah. But it even yeah. says also there that. that um, Joseph didn't know her until after Jesus was born. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That says a lot about Joseph. I'd yeah. love to go yeah. in and find out a bit more. It doesn't say that. a lot about what happened with Joseph, you yeah. know, with the Christian Christianity and all of that. It talks about Mary, the mother, but it yeah. talk about Joseph. Mm. He was an older man, apparently. What's an yeah. older man? He must have been a, a wonderful man, yeah. too. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. So anyway, we, we talked about these things, and then I talked about before the flood, we seem to have had a time of disobedience. Adam, the God in the garden, the fallen angels, Satan and Lucifer and a third of the angels, they had a time on the earth before the flood uh, where they were all disobedient, the angels and, and Satan was thrown to the earth, uh, there seemed to be a bit of intermarrying that actually happened. So we have a whole fallen world that God took the, the pieces out of and even in that, in, in Noah, we still had the lineage of Jesus Christ that comes down through Adam and through Enoch and, and through all those people down through Noah. We have the lineage that comes through. And then we went on to Mark 16, which by the way is a scripture that I use all the time um, in my witnessing. Mm -hmm. I was always taught right from the beginning, uh, Mark 16 is where Jesus Christ commanded his disciples after he rose again from the dead he, he commanded his disciples to go into the world and preach the gospel and the signs that actually follow the preaching of the gospel the signs follow the preaching of the gospel it's no good running out there looking for the signs and trying to do the signs if you're not doing the first bit which is preaching the gospel and that's God's stuff he's the one that confirmed in Mark 16 they said they went on and he confirmed the witnessing and the preaching and the healing and that with uh, the preaching of the gospel with the signs following. And I mentioned that nowhere else in the Bible were people told to, in the Old Testament, go out and preach apart from the likes of Jonah who had to go to the fallen um, uh, Nineveh. Nineveh. Now, and I mentioned, you know, the back then Nineveh were hated by the Jews because Nineveh had a very strong tyrannical type uh, control over over Israel and they were under bondage there if you look at the history books so um, Jonah was told to go and do a job and he went in the exact opposite direction and disobedience now go ye go ye Jonah over there and preach the gospel to your enemies who've got the whole of Israel in, in captive Jonah knew his God he knew that God was compassionate and that he loved people and he gave give people a chance and you know all of us as Christians know today he gives people a chance and uh, he didn't want to go and do the job because he thought God might just forgive them and that's what happened and Jonah got brassed off but in a sense Jonah is like us a lot of us go in the opposite direction instead of going into the world to preach the gospel we go off and do the career thing or whatever you know not them saying it's bad but we go right into Babylon as such. We get caught up in money, we get caught up in mortgages, we get caught up in all of those other things and the, the, the passion for becoming somebody or something in this world, that in that, and I, I'm talking from experience because I've actually been through that scenario, God blessed me and he, he took me out of the ditch, concreter, um, digging footings, forestry, put a tie around my, my neck and put me into business scenario. I ended up within six months in a sales position as a sales engineer, I was quite young, and then they used to fly me off to Wellington where I used to um, preach the world, in a sense, to the architects and engineers and sell them the concept of, of um, energy conservation air conditioning, air conditioning systems for multi-storey buildings. 
So um, I know all about chasing the dollar and chasing the career because I've been there. And I went from there to another one, to another one, to another one, to another one. Yet I went in the opposite direction to what God was saying. You could say, oh, no, 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 you could still, and I did. You still preach the gospel where you are. Yeah, I did that as well. Mm. But in a sense, I could have used all of that energy for the last 37 odd years in God's stuff. There are people that have, have sown uh, seeds of churches right around the world who've had less than 37 odd years. So I, I look at stuff like that and I think, well, hey, you know, um, we've got to make some decisions. When he says, go ye, are we going to go ye or are we going to go in the opposite direction like Jonah? And then he said, uh, you know, baptizing them in Matthew, the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Acts 2, we started talking about this whole area of tongues, the evidence. We talked about tongues in 1 Corinthians is a sign to the unbeliever. Now, when people hear the tongues like they did on Acts 2 uh, in the day of Pentecost, they were drawn to what was happening to find out what was happening. Now, whilst we just mentioned that, Carol mentioned to me about this uh, guy she saw Paul, 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 Paul the apostle Paul. down in a fellowship revival fellowship down in um, Toowoomba. He goes right around the world to Zambia and to Rwanda and all these places and he's seated churches right around the world and he's got a fellowship in Toowoomba. They do extensive tongues on the gift, uh, extensive teaching on the gifts. Mm -hmm. And he said that when he first got saved, he went to a meeting and he was learning Latin. Yeah. And uh, he was learning the, the modern Latin and he went to the meeting and this guy got up and spoke out in tongues, public tongues in the meeting, and it was the old traditional, the old Latin. traditional Latin. Mm. And he thought, how do this guy speak old traditional uh, Latin in the spirit that he's never learned when I'm being trained to learn the other language? You know, and that convinced him of the reality of God, mm. which is a similar experience to mine, except it wasn't in that way. It was actually the tongues that... Um, when they were praying in tongues. When he said, let's pray, they all bowed. I bowed my head, being an Anglican, waiting for somebody to spout off a prayer, and everyone went off in tongues, and I just thought, what's going on here? But not only were the tongues, what came was power and authority up through me to the point I was shaking while I was standing there thinking, what, where am I? You know, what am I doing here? So 1 Corinthians 14, 22 says, tongues is for a sign to the unbeliever. Um, and it also says in 14, 1 Corinthians 14, 2, He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto man, but unto God. And I talked about the tongue. The first thing God seemed to have done is control the tongue on the day of Pentecost. He controlled the tongue. And the tongue seems to, as it says, be set on fire from hell in James 3, 6. The tongue is little. It's set on fire from hell. Um, it can it talks about the tongue as a rudder on a ship and then it can actually turn a whole ship around and how and this goes right back to the first Bible study we did on the word when I talked about the word of God is quick and powerful sharper than a two-edged sword now if we just hold there and go on to the book of Daniel Daniel 10 Website up there on the net there I had the, the other day I had a hundred and something hits in one day. Yeah. hundred and something. Yeah. People visited the site of my um, my vids. Everyone got Daniel 10? Third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long, and he understood the message and had an understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was had had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all. 
until three whole weeks will fulfill. Now, when you look at this whole book of Daniel, and we'll probably do a study on it at some stage, a whole lot of visions and dreams come through. The two kings involved were Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus. Now, God was dealing with Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus. Daniel seemed to be an example in the middle of all of that. You did? Yeah. Yeah. Nebuchadnezzar, as close as you can get, discovered that God was real. Nebuchadnezzar, um, um, God dealt with him, and I won't talk about it here, but he dealt with him, and then he ended up worshipping the Lord and saying, you know, you were God, you were God. Cyrus was mentioned in the Bible, and somebody went and told him and said, you were in there, in the Old Testament. And, uh, you know, this is what it says about you. And Cyrus instigated the, um, the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. And Daniel was, and some of this, the godly Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and all of them, all the stories are in there. Uh, um, Daniel was, in, was God's um, man for the moment. Now he ate no pleasant food, so he had a fast, no meat or wine, and he came into came to his mouth, nor did he anoint himself. He was mourning for three whole weeks. Now you see you know, if you intercede for people, Carol would know a little bit about that. You get that, you get you get a mourning spirit sometimes. Um, I've had it on and off for different people over the years. My two brothers are a classic example. Uh, and both of them got saved and and what actually happened was with uh, with my two brothers is I just felt this heaviness of spirit and I I didn't want to talk to anybody I went straight into the room and I got down on my knees and I prayed and I cried prayed and cried and within weeks God dealt with them uh, they both got saved or one got saved the other one got remarried that's right actually both got remarried that's right they both got remarried because they've been going through hard time in their, their uh, marriages. But prior to that, um, years before that, they got saved about the same time that I, I got saved. So this morning, he was mourning. And what was he mourning over? On the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Euphrates. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in colour, the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them, so they fled to hide themselves. In other instances where they've seen that type of thing, the people have all fallen over in fear. And like Daniel was left alone, and there was no strength remaining in him, he says his vigour was turned to frailty, and I retained no strength, yet I heard the sound of his words, and while I heard the sound of his words, I was in deep sleep on my face, with my face on the ground. Suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. I believe this was the Lord Jesus actually that came to see him. If you look in Revelation, you'll see the same type of thing. It was Jesus that turned up. Oh, actually, no, it wasn't Jesus. This was uh, an archangel, but it looks similar to Jesus. So the archangel, he stood trembling, and he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. So, from the first day that you set your heart to understand. And that's what I was talking about there last week. We need to question a lot of stuff. Um, God requires us to do that. You know, I'll, uh, there's a lot of things that we do in our walks that we, we're not sure why we do. There's a, a lot of people have asked the question, why did Jesus Christ die on the cross? The average person on the street has no clue. No. They have no clue. A lot of Christians 
sitting in the pews don't know why. Why did he have to die on the cross? Why did he, you know, there's this whole issue of the sacrificed lamb, there's the, uh, the he that hangs on a tree is cursed, um, all of this stuff, the blood sacrifice, uh, why the blood sacrifice, there's a lot, and I won't go into that one on this, this study, but he wanted to, what did he want to understand? Daniel wanted to find out, he had been going through, he had, he had scrolls, and he was going through the scrolls trying to work out what this was all about. There was stuff in there that was talking about the captivity of Jerusalem and about when they were going to get back there and all of that. And the whole book of Daniel talks about that. When you get to the end of Daniel, it talks about the end times. I think it's in Daniel, he says uh, right at the end, if you have a look at the end of Daniel, Actually, it's, uh, well, it's in there somewhere. It's towards you in there. It talks about how the chariots on the highways will be jostling each other to and fro. And uh, and it was talking about the beams, the lamps coming from the, um, the chariots, which are like headlights. So if you look closely at it, and I'll find it later on, but it's, I can't see it there straight away, but it talks about them jostling on the highways. And he's talking about cars. Thousands of years before cars even existed. You know, headlights on the cars. So here was Daniel fasting. And even before he began his fast, his words were heard up there. What's this all about, Father? You know, it's morning. He decided to do a fast. I get that every now and again, you know. I don't get flash stuff like this happening in my past. <laughs> you know, but, but when you're called to do something, it's a spiritual thing because we are spirit mm-hmm. beings. So um, he said, your words, your words were heard in heaven. Your request was heard in heaven, Daniel. I have come because of your words. Why did you come? Not because of fasting. Not because of the prayer. Not because of the heaviness, because of the words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me, said, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. So Michael came to help him. Now, it could be the Lord. But Michael, the archangel, one of the archangels, came down to help him. Now, as we started this whole Bible study, we talked about the power of words and how do they fight up there, and how did how did this other how did the the Prince of Persia, um, this angel, this big angel, demonic angel from from uh, in heavenly places, how did he withstand um, this this angel, or if it was Jesus, I don't know. But Michael came and helped him. How did Michael help him? You know. In the New Testament, it talks about fighting principalities and powers in high places. Who are they? Who are they attacking? They're not attacking Joe Blow on the street there, who's just going down the pub for another beer. He doesn't believe in God. They attack people right in there in the church, doing our our daily stuff. We get attacked. Um, The, the angel, if that's Jesus Christ that came down to see him, he wouldn't have come down unless the words were spoken. Unless he, he really wanted to find out what the answer was. Unless he wanted this conversation we're reading here now recorded in the book forever. So, you know, how powerful are our words? How powerful are our prayer? How powerful are our speaking in tongues in the Mm -hmm. Spirit? Mm -hmm. How important is it for the plan of God? Why would He put it in place? 
Why does he want us to use it? Why does he want us to go out and proclaim the gospel? Because God's plan has us in it. God's plan requires us sometimes to do the fast or to get down before God and say, what's this all about? Lord, I don't understand this book of Daniel. Lord, I don't understand this, this revelations. Lord, I, I'm in a, in a spot here. I've, I've got a heaviness over me. What's that all about? You know? Should I fast? Should I get into prayer? Should I be at the prayer meeting? If you don't like worship and praise, as I said, you know, consider whether or not you're in the kingdom of God because it's, that's all they're doing up there. It's 24-7 with the Lord in the throne. Um, he gives us answers in here and he gives us answers in the spirit. As I say, when I get together with the Lord to do something important like this or a, a preach or whatever, I get preached to. While I, and, and I get, I have questions that come in my head about specific things and as I go and do my daily paint, suddenly I get some answers or some interesting answers, which I think are, think are answers. Or, you know, it might not be written down here, but it answers a whole lot of things. It gives me an idea of, of, of the answer of what I was thinking about. So we are up against principalities and powers in high places. How do we answer a lot of the issues there? The basic tools we have. Prayer, praise, worship, fellowship. As I said the other week there, you know, a good start to your Christian walk would be to turn up at church. <laughs> if you want to be a servant, start turning up and filling a seat. You know, a lot of people need to know that. You know, it's not about getting stuff. And we've got to be very careful. Um, you know, a lot of Christianity is, is, is becoming more modernised to the point of church. If I go to church, then I've, I've fulfilled my thing and I've done a good Christian work. I mean, going to church or listening to a great sermon on TV, is not, that's not the great work at all. Mm. <laughs> you know, somebody spoke about that not long ago. And, you know, it's true. You're just for you, what you're doing is is being processed. I talked about uh, you know the world and our Christian walks. What is the system of of pre-flood? Then they've got the flood through to the the faith of Abraham, the children of Israel. Then you get to Jesus Christ. It's, we seem to have gone through stages. We're now on a last stage, which is not going to end if, if the Lord returns in our time, because we're going on into the millennium and eternity. So we'll be in a third, in a third stage, a third processing. In a sense, the world is like an incubator for us. We're being incubated. We receive the seed, just like Jesus Christ did, and he was the firstborn among many brethren. Romans 8, 29, we are being processed as well, the sons of God. The world is waiting for the, uh, what is it, the manifestation of the sons of God. Mm. It's groaning. Because uh, when that happens, the true purpose of God will be understood. So we're going through this whole incubation process, and that happens in our lives, in our walk, our Christian walk. The process of going to church, the process of seeding churches, the processes of laying hands on the sick, of laboring in prayer like Daniel did to find out what the answer was. You see, God listens. He listened. He didn't just leave Daniel down and say, there's Daniel again, like doing a fast. You know, there's Wayne, he's on another one. You know, he does listen. Of course he does. You haven't wasted it. I remember I did a 40 when I first started the fellowship here and, and Ingrid said to me, and, and um, how are you feeling? Because it was halfway through the 40 day fast. You know, are you getting revelations and all of this? I said, I just feel hungry. Ingrid. <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> That's profound. <laughs> yeah. But I've been through several 40 day fasts where I've just felt hungry. You know? But I've got down and done my thing before the Lord. I've had communion every night, you know, with the Lord. And so he listens. He listened to, to his. And so in the in this whole scenario here, 
we got into the book of Acts, and that's a very interesting one because mm. the book of Acts hasn't got an amen on it. And that means that it's still going. So you think about it, you put yourself in there in the book of Acts. Mm. You know, we might not all be Paul, but we're all doing our bit if we're still desiring to know what's happening mm. like Daniel. Uh, Paul was the same. Paul got down before the Lord and he, he wanted to know and he wanted to know. That's why he was able to write all of those um, all of those messages, you know, in, in the, um, the different books. Through the Holy Spirit, he wrote, penned it down, and it's all anointed stuff. He was listening to God. He healed when it was required. He preached where it was and he laid his life down just like Jesus did um, as a sacrifice. Um, he didn't follow the opposite direction. He didn't disappear in the opposite direction like Jonah did. Um, or a lot of us that have gone off and decided, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm a good Christian now, so on top of that I want my this and I want that and I want this and I want that. I'm not saying that that's bad, but I'm saying where it gets to the stage where it just overrides the whole purpose and plan of God in your life, then you will regret it at some stage. I'm not saying that they're all not going to get to heaven. What I'm saying is that they'll get somewhere in their life where they'll sit down and think, what have I done? What have I done? You know, with my Christian walk. Um, what have I done this year? What have I done last year? You know, have I saved anybody? Um, have I baptized anybody? Has anybody been here? Have I brought anybody, nurtured anybody along? You know? Or what have I done? So, um, the book of Acts, we talked about tongues. Uh, people heard them speaking in tongues as it fell on them. As he preached the gospel, the Holy Ghost fell on them because they heard them speak in tongues. And um, in the book of Acts 3, 6, if we go there, In Acts 3, 1, actually right at the start, Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. That's be nine o'clock in the morning, I suppose. And a certain lame man from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who went at the temple. Now, if we stop there, that guy would have been there when Jesus was going to the temple. They said they laid him there daily. He would have been there when Jesus Christ walked past many times going to the same temple. Now, Jesus healed thousands of people. He, he did massive miracles around the place. People, people um, flocked and all were healed. People were, were dragged on a pallet and dropped down, dropped down through the roof and he was healed, you know? Yet this man who was there every day, they brought him there every day, was still there after Jesus was crucified for that particular moment. Here's the moment here. Who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple to ask for arms, for money. Fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. He said, look at me, give me attention. So he gave him his attention expecting to receive something from them. In a lot of instances, if you look at that whole thing, there are certain amounts of certain formula. Paul's often looked in and seen, perceiving that somebody had the faith to be here, has called him out, you know, and prayed for him and he's been here. This guy was expecting to receive something, and Peter said, I don't have any money, silver and gold, I don't have. But what I do have, I give to you. Peter knew what he had, because on the day of Pentecost, it came down with power, and he stood up, opened his big mouth, and boom, the guy who ran off and denied the Lord three times, was standing there, all powerful there, in the Holy Spirit, opened his mouth, 3,000 got saved. Now, like, if the Lord took you the next day, you'd be happy. Some of us, after 37 years, 
would love to have 3,000 people saved in their ministry. So, what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. He took him by the right hand, so he didn't just lean on there and walk off. He lifted him up. And it's the same scenario as the, um, the man uh, left on the, uh, the road who was beaten up um, and uh, left for dead. And uh, the three types of people walked past. The Jew, priest, who was the other one? Priest, the Levi, Levi, Levi was a priest, and who was the other one? Priest. Yeah, there was three of them. Anyway, so that gives you food for thought. The Samaritan. So the Samaritan was the least person who you would think would give the guy a hand, but he didn't just pat him on the back. Or the others walked by. The Samaritan, the good Samaritan, bound his wounds gave him to drink, clothed him, took him to a place and, and said, I'll pay for any um, uh, to feed, feed this guy. Yeah. Pharisee, isn't it? Pharisee. Pharisee, Pharisee not Levi. No. No. Have a look. So, Peter <coughs> stretched out his hand and he lifted him up. And a Samaritan. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he leaped up he stood and walked and entered the temple with him, walking, leaping and praising God. Mm -hmm. All the people saw him walking and praising God. They knew it was he who sat begging arms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So faith is, an, is a doing word. It's an act, action word. Faith without works is dead. Um, in Matthew twelve thirty six, which I'll finish up there. A good man, oh actually we go back a bit, about the trees. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. Now I mentioned there last week, we just hold there, that um, there's two things that God looks for. And if you look through the Old Testament, right through to the New Testament, obedience was one. Disobedience is like the sin of witchcraft. Remember King Saul disobeyed and so, and, uh, and Samuel came and said, you know, what's he looking for? Obedience or sacrifice? You can fast as much as you want to, you can speak in all the tongues that you, you know, you can have all these fancy gifts, you can have a great musical career or whatever in the Lord, but if you don't have obedience, you're wasting your time. You know, so there's an essence in this whole thing. Obedience is one. The other one is actually God's character. And you see, how does that happen in the New Testament? What we're talking about here, fruit. If you look at the fruit, it's God's character. So God's building character. You see, you can get given all the gifts. You can have all the ministrations and ministries happening in your life. But fruit grows on your tree, which you are. You are trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. So character through our walk or incubation period is a major in God's thing, because you take that on into eternity. Your faith levels and your character goes on into eternity. And of course he needs obedience, because Satan fell, Lucifer fell from heaven through disobedience. Adam and Eve fell through disobedience. Saul lost his kingship. He was the first king. You know, um, he was the first king in Israel. He lost it through disobedience. Right through the Bible, you see disobedience all the way through here and there. God's saying something. The children of Israel disobeyed. 
because the rule was put in place, this is what would happen, this was the word, bang, you go in there and I will, I will remove the inhabitants of that land bit by bit using the um, hornets. How easy is that? That's what he said. He said, if you go in there, I'll remove the inhabitants of the land by the hornets. <laughs> that was what he said. So the second lot that actually did get into the promised land, he didn't use hornets then. But he told the first lot, I would use hornets. So you look at that and you sort of think, well, how easy is that? All you had to do was dress up in your armour and go out there and the hornets would take, take the toll, you know, so fight for you. So either make the tree good and its fruit good or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad for a tree is known by its fruit. Oh, what are you known for? What are we known for? You know, What do people look at us and, and, and what are we known for, each of us individually? Brood of vipers, he said, how can you, being evil, he's talking to the Pharisees there, I think, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. By your words you will be justified, by your words you will be condemned. That word, that word, every idle word is actually the rima which is a speaking out um, and proclaiming word. Every idle speaking out and proclaiming word. Now if I finish here, I'll, you know, uh, scientists have proven that when they go into, actually they, they tested, when they go into the um, Colosseum, places like that, they can actually, using the instruments that they have, pick up words that have been spoken in that area centuries and centuries ago. They're still there, sitting around, embedded in the rocks and all of that around them. They're still there. I've heard that one before. <laughs> yeah, I have. <laughs> yeah. Google it and check it out. Yeah. yeah. So what I'm saying is, you know, that um, uh, by your words can be justified, by your words can be damned, condemned. And out the word that we speak, the Rima words, in our Christian walks, in prayer, people mm -hmm. don't even have to know. When you're interceding for people or whatever, God's there with his book and he's taking account. He was listening to Daniel. He was there. Daniel was right on his vision. And there was a fight that happened. So it didn't happen straight away. He had to go through three weeks of fasting before it came through. But you see, God hears even... He says he knows your needs even before you pray for them. But he requires you, like Elijah... Even after all of that stuff with Elijah, he went up and did the miracles and all of that, he saw massive stuff happen. He still had to go up on the mountain, get on his knees, and pray seven times. And then he had to act in faith when he saw that little cloud come across and say, right, send us Gazabi or whatever his name was down there and say, look, tell him the rain's coming. That's our job and that's, that's our process, you know, and that's what Jesus, if we follow Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, we see Jesus did this all the way through. And he's saying, this is how you do it, this is how you do it. Got your four Gospels there, four versions. Go through, find out, mm -hmm. and step out and he will do the job. The hornets are there for us too, same scenario. You know, the battle is his, the battle is the Lord, the battle has already been won. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. I think you couldn't find